the, the, my very short introduction to the Antarctic was strongly motivated by a desire to try and dislocate the stories that seem to prevail about the Antarctic and Southern Ocean, which tend to focus on penguins and whales and programs like Frozen Planet. Whilst I'm a big fan of those programs, I didn't think they actually capture some of the other aspects of this extraordinary continent and, and surrounding ocean that need greater public understanding. In the main, this revolves around politics, it revolves around conflict, and really the, a kind of future for this continent that is going to be increasingly controversial. In the very short introduction, I have five or six chapters where I try and tease out the kind of varied human geographies of this particular place. Starting, for example, from the earliest histories of exploration and discovery, going all the way up to the sort of present and indeed future possibilities for the Antarctic. I feel very strongly that actually we need to have a far more explicit discussion about, for example, the resource politics of the Antarctic. This is a continent for the last 200 years that has been imagined as a kind of resource treasure house, initially sealing and whaling, but more recently fishing and possibly biological prospecting, where, for example, commercial organisations are seeking to derive benefit from particular aspects of Antarctica's organisms. I also felt that the Antarctic needs to be understood for what it is in terms of governance. How do nation states agree to collaborate and cooperate with one another in a continent without an indigenous human population? One of the key facets of this particular uh, issue is the 1959 Antarctic Treaty and the way in which the countries involved tried to secure cooperation with one another was to privilege and to prioritize science. Fifty years after the signing of this treaty, however, it's not at all clear to me that what science is going to be good enough to maintain a consensus on the governance of the Antarctic. New commercial pressures are increasingly intruding in the Antarctic. One of the most obvious is tourism, but another is commercial large-scale fishing. And if you thought, for example, everyone agreed that environmental protection in the Antarctic was a good thing, then you'd be mistaken. One of the most controversial aspects affecting the Antarctic at the moment is the idea of marine protected areas. Instinctively, they sound like a good idea. Who wouldn't want to protect the marine environment? But when you then put that together with the commercial interests of nation states, and in particular the fishing industries, then who gets to decide where and why the Antarctic is protected becomes a lot more problematic. Now, thinking about the sort of commercial and the resource pressures shouldn't also, I think, uh, disturb us from thinking about other aspects of the Antarctic. Uh, one area that I try to cover in the very short introduction is to do with gender and to try and explore why the Antarctic has been a particular place for men uh, to perform heroically and decisively. So whilst Ranulph Fiennes, for example, may lose another finger, it's also worth, as I try to do in this very short introduction, remind us the extraordinary contribution women have made to the Antarctic. And on the final note, in terms of other kinds of contributions, the future politics of the Antarctic is going to be increasingly decided in places like China, South Korea and India. If the 20th century was one dominated by Britain, the United States and European countries, the 21st century, when it comes to the Antarctic, is going to be dominated by East Asian states. So there's going to be a lot more to watch and write about when it comes to the Antarctic.